Welcome to Helen Bulkley Talks With and this week I bring you an interview with the incredible Lucy Gossage. Now she's incredible because she's an oncologist and also a top triathlete with 14 Iron Distance Championship titles to her name. Now she was a full-time triathlete for a few years but now she's back focusing on her career in medicine but still 100% dedicated to her own fitness and also her initiative 5k your way move against cancer which ties together her passion for exercise and her career as a cancer doctor i'm going to start nice and lightly here but i basically think you're superwoman um because you are a cancer doctor and you're also a very well respected triathlete as everyone's turning to focus on prioritizing themselves and their fitness you are the perfect person for me to talk to that you can you can do it all so let's go right back to the start how did you get into duathlons and triathlons and pushing yourself for really long periods of time it's quite it's quite a funny story actually so I wasn't um I wasn't sporty as a child um and I I actually I came last in a cross country when I was 13 I didn't do anything competitively after that um until I was until I was 26 um and at the time I was living with a guy with a gay up for quite a long time we started having a few issues so I signed up for the London triathlon just as a, a friend said oh maybe you should do a triathlon and um so I thought well that'd be a good challenge um, so I bought myself a bike and I, I, and I could swim, but I couldn't swim front pool, so I let to swim front pool and um, I used to go out and I just used to do the distances and I, so I did the London triathlon and, and loved it and then about I think the week after that me and my boyfriend ended up breaking up um, and I was teaching some medical students on, on the ward and they knew that I'd done the triathlon and they told me about a friend of theirs that had done an Ironman and I said what's an Ironman and they told me and I was like that's ridiculous like that's impossible <laughs> um, and then yeah then I got quite drunk with some friends a few weeks later and I said oh if I'm single on New Year's Day I'm going to do an Ironman this was kind of September time um, and then New Year's Eve I was up in Scotland and I met a guy who'd done an Ironman um, and he said it was amazing one of the best things he'd ever done and I was like that's this is fate I've, I've got to do one so um yeah, the the second of January, I, I got went to David Lloyd, the gym that I used to go to. I was like, right, start the treadmill. Um, if I can do a half marathon, so I've never run a half marathon before. If I can do a half marathon, then I'll I'll sign up for this Ironman, and I like I literally press the start, and um, and you know got to thirteen point one miles, kind of fell off. Was like, oh, right, I'll sign up for this Ironman. So um, yeah, that's how I got into it. So it was really just a a drunken dare, a bit of a challenge. <laughs> I've seen lots of pictures of you crossing the finish line. And of course, that is the moment, isn't it? When, oh, there's that big relief. You've done it, all the hard work. Yeah. What's that moment like? My, like, obviously, my, you know, my finish photos are, are quite kind of famous. It's probably all word, But, you know, I, I'm known for my finish line ce celebrations as a professional. But what's nice is I actually finished the same way when I finished my first Ironman um, and, and it is just natural and it's that kind of pent up release of all that energy, that hard work that, that just comes out on the finish line. It's just raw emotion. It's not, it's not kind of synthetic. It's not put on. That was how I finished my first one. That was how I finished my last one. Um, but yeah, I mean, it is, it is tough and, and, and Ironman's never easy. Like you never have a, a day where you think, oh, that was easy because it is so long and, and you kind of don't want it to be easy either because, you know, you, you signed up for it because it's hard and, and you want to know that you're only getting the best out of yourself if there are hard parts. And um, I think that's why it's, it's such a special feeling when you finish. Um, but, but looking back, I think I'm, I'm probably more proud of the days that I didn't do well um so so I you know I've won a lot of races and that's great but generally you win a race when you're having a good day um and I'm actually probably more proud with hindsight of the races that I didn't win where where I put up a good battle or where something had gone wrong in the in the run-up or in the race and um those are the days where it's easy to pull the plug and those are the days that it's, it takes a lot to finish mentally and physically and um yeah those are the days that will probably stay with me forever and it probably changed, you know, shaped me um, more than the days where you're running around at the front and everyone's cheering you. And, you know, my friends would say, it's, it's easy for you, Goss. You don't, you don't have to think about running hard. Everyone's cheering you and chasing your name. And that's true. But when you're in fifth place, you don't get that as much. Um, 
and those are yeah they're the days that, that you find that how strong you are mentally oh well that's a really interesting point it's really it's really good to hear you say that and also what i really liked is when you say it hurts whatever and i think that's really key with fitness isn't it whether you're just starting out or whether you're at the top if it's not hurting then you're not pushing yourself so it hurts whatever that's not to put people off it's just to say you know that is part of it isn't it certainly in an iron man i mean it's it's long you'll get yeah you're definitely going to get dark patches and um i always i always think i i always say and i stand by it that physical fitness is is really important but actually mental toughness is is just as important and that's why i became the triathlete i did um because i loved it but also because i I was mentally strong. There were lots of athletes who were far physically stronger than me and had far more natural talent. But I, I don't think anyone had, I, I, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd vie with anyone for mental strength and, and mental toughness and um, that can get you a long way. <laughs> so that was my talent, my mental strength and my talent rather, um, yeah, rather than my physical. Well, I think I think I, I think that you're strong physically as well, but that's really <laughs> good to, to know. And and when you were talking then about the most meaningful things, and I love that that you know you, you of course love winning, but you, you're really proud of yourself when it's been a, in a big fight. I wonder whether one of those moments when you were talking about we had a broken clavicle not long before you were put. Oh God, yeah. I mean that was <laughs> that was that was really special. So that was. Um, the world championships in 2016 um and i i, I had two and a half years of full-time athlete um and i was going back to work after that race like two weeks after that that race um and there was that was an unnegotiable like i'd you know i've gone from no years out to one year out to two years out to two and a half years out that i had to go back and then i broke my collarbone eight weeks before um and I, yeah i i remember thinking you know i didn't know i didn't think i'd be able to race um on paper, I, I shouldn't have been able to race really, but um, yeah, I went there and I came ninth um, in the world championships. It was actually my best best result there, um, and yeah, I think that for me was just it was. I was just racing with joy, with passion. Um, there was no pressure, there was no expectation. I kind of remember just running and going, like, I can't believe this is. I can't believe I've got here to run in the world championships and. Um, you know, eight weeks ago, I was lying on the floor with a broken collarbone. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> God, you must have been so proud of yourself, and rightly so. So, uh, just what you were saying there about taking one year out, then two years out, and then you had to go back. How did that work? Because I know you were a professional triath uh, triathlete for, uh, is that professional triathlete for a time? Yeah. So, you basically took a hiatus from work, did you? Yeah, so I got good at triathlon um, because I, I did a PhD. So as, as an oncologist, um, most people would do a PhD. And I moved from Nottingham, um, where I was a, a registrar, so registrar as a level below consultant. Um, so I've done two and a half years as, as that. Um, and then I moved to Cambridge to start this PhD. And actually, the first, I was just in the lab and, and I hated it, particularly the first year. And I felt lost. I didn't really have any any purpose in in life and I was I well no that's not true but I did I wasn't getting the job satisfaction and because of that I started to train rather than exercise and, and triathlon became more important so then I um I ended up getting my pro license kind of halfway through that PhD um and I was still working full time and then I, I reduced my PhD time to part time um for another two years was racing professionally at that time and then when I finished the PhD um, I was like, it's now or never. Um, I'm gonna, you know, I'm never gonna get this time back. And I had some sponsors, and um, so so I, I negotiated a year out, and then that became <laughs> two years out. And then at the end of the second year, I was like, Look, you know, I said I want to do one more World Championships, which was another um, another six months. So it really, what well, I was very lucky to have the support of my um, my hospital because a lot of people wouldn't have um, wouldn't have had that. How do you sort of come down from being a professional and then, you know, lock into a, a very serious job? How did you make that transition and where, where's, where's triathlons now for you? Well, I, I, mean, I went back to work at the end of 2016, but I, um, so I was working part time um, and I carried on racing professionally for another, well, 2017 and 18. I was definitely racing at a, a very high level professionally. Um, and then 2019 was kind of my my retirement year where I was, I was just doing some fun stuff and, and wasn't living my life around triathlon, but was still 
you know, I did the Norseman, which is extreme triathlon. They may call it World Championships, but it's not really. But I did that and um, and some other cool stuff. Um, and then I, yeah, I retired pro- properly at the end of um, at the end of last year. Um, and I've actually, I'm, and now I'm a consultant oncologist. Um, so yeah, now I, I work part time. Um, I have just been working full time for a few few months um, just because of COVID, but. Yeah, I work part time. Um, I still exercise a lot, but just for fun. Um, but I do a lot of other stuff um, in my free time. That <laughs> free time, <laughs> it's kind of work, but it's not. It's not paid work. Yeah, and I noticed that whilst you were working a lot harder during lockdown with COVID, you did the Everesting Challenge on Zwift, I <laughs> thought. Um, and I thought that was brilliant because obviously you are used to training at a high level. And as you just said, it is a passion of yours and you do it, do it for enjoyment. But for people that don't know, the Everesting Challenge, like you basically climbed on, on a static bike, the height of Everest, which is nearly 9,000 metres. And this was all whilst you were help, you know, working through the pandemic. So tell me a bit about that. Tom, the guy that I live with, we're, you know, we're like, there's nothing else to do. It's, we're in we're stuck inside, you know, you can go out once a day, there's no, there's no challenges, there was no, I just wanted to be out on my comfort zone, and the fact that I knew it would be tough was kind of why I wanted to do it, Um, and it was actually, it was bizarre, it was a mate, it flew by, I had no, I never, you know, I had no idea that how I really, 10 hours on the turbo could just fly by, but we all on Zoom, we could talk to each other, and it was just being out of my comfort zone, and I think I'll always do stuff like that, uh, you know, but I had three months off last year between um, finishing as a registrar and starting as a consultant. I went cycle touring in Peru and I, was, I remember I was on my own. I was cl- it was all at altitude, like super high altitude. It was absolutely stunning. I remember one day I was smashed and, it, you know, I was at like 4,000, 4,500 metres and I was cycling up this hill, the mountain, gasping for air. I'd run out of food. I was like, why am I doing it? you know, why am I putting myself through this? And then you get to the top and you get this high, like, you can't get that unless you've been out. The fact that it's hard is why I love it. And yeah, you don't necessarily love it in the moment, but that's what, that's what makes me feel alive. And I need to, I need to keep bits of that in my life. And you can make, you know, last weekend I did something stupid just because I knew that I just wanted to be out of my comfort zone. I wanted that feeling where you're, you know, you're, you're thinking, I don't know if I'm going to get home. And and that, yeah, it, it's weird, but um, yeah, it's important for me, particularly because work's, you know, work's quite challenging emotionally. And I think it's almost a bit like meditation for me, just getting, getting so exhausted, getting so that you can't stress about anything. All you're thinking about is how you're going to get home and how you, you know, that, that takes away all the little stuff that you normally stress about or the things at work and, um, yeah. <laughs> Well, that was actually going to be one of my questions to you, which is really interesting you brought up there. Your Peru trip sounds incredible, by the way. Um, <laughs> that sounds amazing. Um, is the fact that exercise is a fantastic way to de-stress. And um, obviously you think there's real value in that. And and it's one of those things, a lot of people sometimes, and I, I could be one of them, it, when you have a plan to go and do something and you think, now I've got to go and do it. I just don't feel like it. But when you push through and you do it, that's when it's like, yes, you know, that feeling is awesome. Yeah. You forget about all the other difficult things. Yeah. And I think I realised, you know, in lockdown, um, particularly at the start, I think I realised then just how important exercise was to me. Um, and, and it was, you know, I was really, I wasn't training for anything. I was just exercising for mental health and particularly, you know, cycling home because we had, the roads were beautiful, absolutely, because there were no cars. And that we, had, we had this amazing weather um, and I'd cycle home from work and, it, it, you know, I'd be stressed, I'd be tired. And then an hour and a half into my ride home, I'd, or it, even less than that sometimes, but I'd suddenly be like, it's like click. I'm done. I'm, I'm de-stressed. And it was, it was just so important to me. Um, and I think I'm just so glad. And I, I'm not a fan of our government in the slightest. Um, but I am so glad that they, they allowed us to keep exercising during it. Um, because I think for the mental health of so many, it's, it's so important. Um, so that's the only thing I think they've done right during this. <laughs> but um, I'm glad they, glad they made that call. <laughs> Yeah. And do you think because you deal with very tough things every day at work and 
it, you know, what you do for a passion is tough because as you said at the top of Peru, even though it felt great, it was painful to get that. Is that, is that one of your coping mecha mechanisms that, um, that mindset of yours that you have, you, you deal with this toughness and you get out the other side? When I'm, when I'm suffering in a race, I always find it really helpful to remind myself that, that that's a choice that I'm choosing to suffer and that I, I need to suffer to know that I'm getting my, the best out of myself. And, and I, I, I often think, you know, my patients don't get that choice. And, and to be able to choose to put yourself out of your comfort zone is a, is a real privilege. And remembering that I find really helpful. Um, I mean, when I think of what some of my patients <laughs> go through, you just think, you know, what I what we decide to do in our free time, it's, it's nothing compared to a lot of, you know, the, the young people that are on chemotherapy for months and months, followed by surgery, followed by radiotherapy, followed by more chemotherapy, in and out of hospital. You just think, and, and they cope it, you know, they, they go from being an, an 18 year old boy who's, or 17 year old boy who's, who's just worried about school and, and what, you know, things at school to suddenly being in this roller coaster of cancer. And, and you can't imagine being able to deal with it, but people do, they, you know, every single person, any of my patients, I'm sure if you had said to them, this is what you're going to have to go through in a year, they'd have been like, well, I can't go through that. And they, and they do. Um, and, and the resilience of, humans is just incredible and it's quite empowering when you when you see that and you know it's hard then to think I'm hungry my legs are tired I mean I want to stop you're like well you know you people can can do so much more than they think they can and, and I think my patients show that every single day well, that's um, that's an amazing tie-in, like that that they inspire you when you're out there, and and it's so true. And actually, having you articulate that, you're right. When when you when you're seeing what people are going through, um, and then when you t when you think about what you're going through as a choice, and that's a, a really um, a really amazing point. And um, can you tell me a bit away about your fabulous a bit about your fabulous initiative of Five K Your Way? So yeah, Five K Your Way Move Against Cancer is um, an initiative I co-founded with an incredible lady, Gemma Hinia Moses. Um, and it's really simple. It's just a, an initiative to encourage anyone living with and after cancer to walk, jog, run, cheer, or volunteer at park runs on the last Saturday of every month. Um, and we call ourselves a, a support group with a difference, a coffee morning with a difference. Um, and we've now got, we've gone from two, over two years to obviously before lockdown, we had I think 57 groups across the UK and Ireland. Um, and it's, yeah, it just came about because there, there is good evidence that being active is, um, is good for people living with and after cancer. Um, and there was actually one patient who, um, who triggered the idea for me and he was a young guy. I hadn't been looking after him, but he'd had, he'd been theoretically cured of his cancer, but during the treatment he'd put on so much weight, he wasn't doing anything really, he'd lost his job, he's lost his friends, and I just really resonated, and I, I just remember seeing him one day in the retreat, which is the room young people, and I just thought, how, like, you know, as I say, I haven't been involved in looking after him, but I was just so struck by the, the negative effects that cancer treatment can have, and you can be cured, but your life doesn't just come back to normal. Um, so I had this idea about trying to get people down to park run and then, you know, the people I spoke to in the hospital were like, no one wants to do that. And then I heard about Gemma who'd founded Move Charity. So Gemma had cancer when she was 24. She's a runner um, and she had founded Move Charity um, about 18 months before that, um, which was aiming to help young people through um, through the power of sport, young people who've had cancer. And I thought it was a massive charity because she had an amazing website. It turned out it was just Gemma and her husband. Anyway, Gemma and I met and we clicked and um, I said, I've got this idea about Park Run. She said, oh, I think that's a great idea. So um, that's how we started. Uh, and we just kind of thought, we'll just give it a go in Nottingham, see whether anyone turns up. Um, and again, going back, you know, looking about triathlon, I think before triathlon, I would have been scared to do something like that because, um, because I would have thought, well, probably no one will come. And, but actually what, you know, I, I don't, I'm not scared of failure anymore. So, so what if no one comes? It doesn't matter. Um, and yeah, it was such an uplifting Saturday morning. We, we said we'll do it the last Saturday every month. And then um, I guess through free social media, which again, because of, triathlon I've got a little bit of a platform not a big platform but enough that I can do you know I can tell enough people about stuff um 
we just got more and more contacts from people around the country saying can we start groups and um, yeah now we've got 57 groups around the country and it's just it's incredible seeing some of the, the stories that come out of out of it and I think the norm for people you know that there, there is still this stereotype that if you're on cancer treatment you need to rest um which isn't true and that's probably the worst thing that that, that you can do and and it you know there's very good evidence that it's safer to be active during your treatment than it is to be inactive um but there's also i, st I think still quite a, a common perception that you get diagnosed with cancer that's spread and that you die and that again is not the case anymore and it is obviously for some people but but a lot of people live a very long time with metastatic cancer with cancer that spread and our group showed you know they're a way to showcase living actively despite a cancer diagnosis and, and people can live really fulfilling really enriching um really active lives despite cancer and 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 having you know groups of people who are doing that together can be a, a, an enormous motivator and, but we're definitely not just about running and um, you know we uh, the thing that makes me happiest actually is seeing seeing walkers at the back um and and they're probably the people that wouldn't wouldn't do anything without without 5k your way um and we you know we very much encourage volunteering as well which is a, a great way for people who are not feeling up to, to walking or jogging to come down and still get outside still get that fresh air and still get that support network from um you know from other other participants and part runs just been so welcoming and um enthusiastic and supportive so um yeah obviously we couldn't do it without their support <laughs> Oh, but I, I, I totally know what you mean, actually, because I bef before COVID, I was doing quite a few interviews with people with Park Run. And I know what you mean at the back, because there's always someone in orange, isn't there, that, that is there to finish last and no one finishes yeah. last. And actually, the, the conversation, the camaraderie, it's all at the back, you know, and everyone, everyone's having a great time. So I, that's, I, I totally agree. I'm picking up on that. But what I love about it when people are out and exercising is the stories that come from it. And I'm sure you have tons of stories of, of things that have come out of all your training and your um your eventing but i know you said that in france in 2009 there was something that quite meaningful happened to you in your in your second iron man oh it, it, yeah it, i mean it's just it was it was funny really but i, I guess it just shows mental mental strength that i had that i didn't realize so it was um it was like it was super hot it was i don't know it was 35 degrees or something and it was my second Ironman and I'd, I'd, like the first Ironman I'd done, I'd done really well, but I hadn't, I'd just kind of turned up at it. Well, I hadn't obviously trained, but I had no expectations. Um, and the, the second one, I thought, well, I've, you know, it's two years on, I, I've actually trained for this. Um, I bought some nice wheels for my bike um, and, and I kind of had some expectations. I wanted to qualify for the World Championships as an age group because I'd done it by chance in the first one. So I'm like, surely if I, you know, I've trained for it, surely I can. But then, um, then my wheel broke at the top of the mountain. It was maybe like 70 miles in. So I, I, I was just crying at the side of the road. It was on this closed road, this out and back, and this car stopped. And they, they said in French, they had loads of bike bits. It was a van, not a car. And they were like, tout le funier. I was like, wee, wee, wee. So they gave me a wheel. Um, and it, it was enough to get me down the mountain. I finished the bike. Um, and then I started the run. And it was, it was just so hot. And I just wasn't used to... Um, I hadn't done it, you know, I didn't know how to manage training, exercising in the heat and I was all right to about halfway and then I started getting really dizzy and every, everything, I was kind of leaning to the left and 5k to go, I like fall into the drinks table, I knock all the drinks off and then two, um, two people start, well, there's some, like marshals start walking to it with me and, and then a girl goes past and I was like, oh, you look, look, let me go, let me go. And I collapse and I end up in this medical tent um, and they give me, I think they gave me two bags of fluid um, and they let me finish. Um, but there were two funny things about that. So I walked to the finish having had two bags of fluid. And the first was that um, the next day I, I went to the race organizers and I said, um, can I get my wheel back? Here's your wheel. And they were like, what are you talking about? And I said, well, the, you know, the support crew took my wheel. And they were like, there wasn't any support crew. So I don't know who the dodgy people are clearly just go around picking up expensive bits of equipment. Um, and then the second money thing was a few, a couple of weeks later, I get a message through the Tri Club and this message is, I'm trying to track down the gobby girl from TFN Tri Club who's in the medical tent. 
And apparently, I can't remember it, but we were, I was on the, the thing and they, they, were trying to, they were trying to put me in an ambulance. Um, and I was like, I'm not going, look, I've only got a mile and a half left. And this other guy was in the medical tent and he had a lap and a mile and a half and he was going to get in. And apparently I was like, don't be ridiculous, you can't get in the ambulance. <laughs> so he finished, but he had another, you know, eight miles or whatever. But anyway, he messaged me and he said, just wanted to say thank you for making me stick it out. And um, I'm so glad that I did finish. <laughs> and um, it's, yeah, it wasn't the time that I wanted, but so much better than not finishing. Um, so yeah, it, it was just one of those random, random oh, yeah. days that you couldn't really make up. <laughs> yeah, you can't make up. What did you say he called you? Oh, I'm trying to get in touch with the Gobby girl. <laughs> Gobby girl from yeah. TFN who's in the medical tent. <laughs> See, I started this by calling you Superwoman. He called you Gobby Girl. <laughs> <laughs> different, different levels of compliments going on. But that's an amazing story. It just goes to show, you were talking about your mental toughness. There were so many opportunities there that people could have been like, well, fair enough, you gave it a good crack. But you got, you got to the finish line. And what's, um, what sort of stands out as being very meaningful? I know earlier you were saying about how you're most proud of your race wins that were tough and you had to really fight to get to the finish, but you've achieved other things like, um, didn't you complete two iron distances in two weeks mm. and, and you had the hundred mile record or, or, you know, things on the bike, things like that. So give me some stats. What are your big, what are your big hitters that you're really proud of? I'm really proud of managing, like, I think I won, so I win eight, eight iron distance races since I went back to work. Um, and I'm really proud of, of getting that juggle, juggling act right and working full time, working part time, but still racing at the top level. Um, and uh, yeah, I just love like, I love challenges. And, and you know, the, the two iron mans in, it was two iron mans in 13 days. It just randomly came to me on a bike ride. And I think I'd done, I mean, it might have just have one Ironman UK. And, and I was like, I didn't want to just do Ironman Wales. I feel like that's, it's not, to, it sounds arrogant, but I was like, I feel like that's, I'd won it before. And it, it was, I love it. It's my favourite race. But I feel, I felt like it wasn't enough. I didn't want to just do Ironman Wales. So I was like, well, why don't I make it hard? Why don't I do Ironman Italy 13 days after? <laughs> and I, I just, I love doing crazy stuff like that. And it was bonkers because I did Ironman Wales and I, and I won it. And then I went back to work for a couple of days. And then I had to go to Berwitz for my cousin's wedding. Um, and then I flew back from Brits and then flew to Italy and you know I hadn't had a massage I hadn't it's just completely bonkers you wouldn't think of that would possibly work but I got to Italy there was zero pressure you know I was like oh, I've just done my my wells no one's going to expect anything and and because of that no pressure I won it um, and and you know that's just that kind of just try something who who, who what's you know don't be scared of failure and I, I used to be so scared of failure and actually now kind of the more likely it is that I might fail the more excited I am by it mm. um so yeah I knew that I could do Ironman Wales I, I actually it wasn't really about winning the two Ironmans it was like can I do another Ironman 13 days after one can I do it who knows and, and that's that's the excitement that kind of challenge <laughs> yeah it's so cool and if you hadn't then you would never have known and you wouldn't have won them <laughs> precisely you never know and, and i think that's one of the biggest things i've learned is don't you know you never want to ask what if and if you've had an idea you know like 5k your way if we're not tried it we never know that and now we've got you know we've created something we are creating something that's so powerful and has so much potential to help so many people and it's so simple but if we just not been you know if we'd been too scared to try because no one might come then we'd never know and and i think that's the biggest lesson i've taken from from triathlon is don't fear failure and and it's always better to try and and fail than to sit at home and think could i have done it could i you know what what if i what if i've been brave enough <laughs> it's always good to try things what if someone's watching this and they think well I you know I like I'm into biking or I'm into running or I, I want to give one of the, another discipline a go as part of the triathlon what would your top tips be for people maybe nervous to give it a go um just giving it a go basically yeah it, it's taking those first steps and I think so many people are scared to and I still get it you know now I'm I, I'm quite nervous about going riding with people I used to go riding with because I, I said to Tom this morning when I left, I've just done a ride with Nikki, a friend who's a, a pro and she's a, 
the bike beast and I always used to beat you on the bike and I said I, I don't like it like, I used to be the you know the bike monster and now I'm the now I'm like I'm nowhere near it and I, I you still get nervous to, you know I, I get nervous about doing doing stuff but I think you, yeah just don't be afraid to take those first steps and that's the hardest part I think yeah, definitely. And that's good. To, that's good to hear that the level you've been at, you still get nervous, but it's hard, isn't it? When you've achieved a lot, um, sort of thinking, oh, I used to be able to do that. <laughs> yeah, I know. And my problem now is that my, you know, my head thinks that I'm exactly the same as I used to be. So I'll set out and I'll, I'll set myself crazy challenges. And then I'm like, actually, this is a lot harder than it used to be. <laughs> Oh, well, I think uh, I think you're doing okay, Lucy. <laughs> you uh, you set yourself massive challenges, but I'm sorry, I've taken lots of your time. I said I'd only be hard. No, I've really enjoyed it. It's been great. <laughs> oh, thank you. I absolutely love talking to you. I love you to chat. Have a nice and um, have a lovely weekend. Yeah, and you take care. <laughs> Thanks so much. Bye.